important topic. Um, Siskiyou County is um, largely forested. Uh, we have a lot of issues with forest management on our private properties and in our industrial properties. But one thing that all, we can all share in common is there's going to be biomass. What do we do with that biomass? Um, so we have two speakers here today to talk about the opportunities in Siskiyou County for biomass utilization. Um, we have Rich Clue with Roseburg, um, who, as you may or may not know, uh, runs a biomass cogeneration plant in Weed. So he's going to speak a little bit to that. And then we have Larry Alexander um, with the Siskiyou Biomass Utilization Group to speak about the broader opportunities for biomass uh, countywide. So um, I would appreciate it if everybody um, gives Rich and Larry a hand for being here. And, <laughs> and I'll hand over to Rich. Can everybody hear me? I'm assuming what they did. Um, so yeah, uh, Kara approached uh, Larry and I here a couple months ago to talk about biomass, and, and specifically for me, since I work for uh, Roseburg Forest Products, and we have the mill and weed, what Roseburg means, or what biomass means to Roseburg, what do we do with it, um, you know, where do we get it, all those kind of things. So. Um, I'm going to apologize a little bit, although the first rule of speaking is never apologize. Before you talk, I'm going to anyway. Uh, Kara's been on, at least me, for the last several weeks to, to figure out exactly what we're going to talk about. I didn't talk to her until yesterday. So there's a couple, and, and mostly until just like 20 minutes ago. So there's three or four slides that I just dumped in here um, 15 minutes ago that I hope it all flows, but the information is there one way or another. So left and right? Yeah. Okay. First and foremost, happy belated Earth Day. I'm a biologist uh, by trade, so um, we all think about the Earth every day. Um, quick overview, um, biomass has been used for a long time. Um, historically, um, energy from wood has been used to power sawmills and pulp and paper mills. Uh, now this old technology is being modernized and adapted on a broader scale. A more efficient use of wood waste to provide renewable energy for communities in the Pacific Northwest, across the country, and actually globally. Biomass is actually pretty big in Europe. Um, a lot of their towns are fueled by nothing but biomass, primarily uh, biomass brick and pellets, which I think Larry will talk a little bit about later. Um, so what is biomass? From, from Roseburg's perspective, generally speaking, it, it's just a, it's, it's material that's out in the woods that doesn't go into another product, whether that be a saw log or a veneer log. Um, it's it's the, the stuff that's left over after you're done logging. Typically that's called slash. And you can see a pile of it there. Uh, there's a loader throwing it in the chipper in the background there. Um, biomass includes the tops of trees and let's see. Okay. These this is what we call a top pile. So this is um, after a tree is mechanically processed. Um, it strips the, the limbs off of it, cuts it into the appropriate lengths, and then you're left with the top wood. And so that's what's piled up back there. And then in the front here, you've got some oaks. It, they're just non merchantable species. Um, they'll get harvested from time to time and, and, uh, in terms of clearing out an area. And, and so you've got to do something with that. And that, we consider that biomass as well. So all of this, in a typical operation, um, after we're done logging, we'll come in with a chipping operation all this gets chipped up. Um, so um, usually, but not always, it's chipped on site um, and then taken to a processing plant. Back up just for a second. There can be different kinds of processing plants. Um, from Roseburg's perspective, it's, it's a cogen um, electrical generating facility. Um, there can be pellet mills, brick mills, um, and then smaller, much uh, more focused um, processing plants that, that Larry will talk a little bit about what they do with their stuff. Um, so another aspect of, of what Roseburg considers biomass is it's the waste or residual material from our milling operation. In weed, it's going to be veneer. And uh, those of you that don't know what veneer is, this this actually, um, it, it would be veneer, but it, it's too narrow, it fell apart. Um, so this is going to get turned into what we call biomass. Um, nothing is wasted. This, the picture you see here is actually the waste chain that goes back to a chipper. So all the actual good sheets of veneer are moving 
left to right across the top of the screen, and then when everything gets done, all the stuff that doesn't make a sheet of veneer or 54 or a fishtail gets dropped down here, sent to a chipper, um, gets conveyed with uh, conveyor belts out to the, the fuel storage yard. Um, so what do we use biomass for? We use biomass to fuel a, a wood-fired boiler. Um, it's uh, about four stories tall, but basically it is a huge wood stove. We burn approximately 18,000 pounds of chips uh, or biomass per hour, and we do that 24-7. Uh, a couple days we go down for maintenance. Uh, this is a load of chips that came in this morning from the tenant area. And uh, if you've never seen chips before, um, this is them. This is from that load. Um, you've got, you know, kind of some branches, uh, some bark, some needles, and just the rest of the, uh, the tree that, that didn't make either a saw log or a veneer log. Um, this is the powerhouse. Um, the boiler itself is located over here. Um, this is the, the fuel house over here. Uh, you can see fuel stacked up. Um, it's put into the, actually this is mostly our dry uh, fuel storage for the winter. Um, but there's a fuel mixer in there called Hercules. Um, it's a drum about as big as this room that rotates and mixes wet and dry fuel. Um, the boiler produces approximately 110,000 pounds of steam per hour at 615 pounds per square inch. <coughs> and the steam comes out of the boiler at about, about 417 degrees, then we superheat it. So if you can imagine, uh, it's, it's kind of like a coil with steam running through it. It's put back through the boiler to, to expand it and heat it up even more, and then it goes to about 875 degrees. Um, we use that steam to produce power. Um, all of the superheated steam is, goes through a 12 and a half megawatt turbine and we use that to generate electricity and that's, that's the turbine right there. It's, it's actually not all that big. Um, it, it's, it's, the length of that photo is less than the width of this room and it's, it's about, uh, I don't know, four or five feet tall, like the turbine wheel. Um, this house in here, it's, it's, I don't think it's much bigger than this. Um, so, of that 12 and a half megawatt capacity that we have, three megawatts goes right to the bill, we're completely self-sustained um, in terms of our energy production and our use, so three megs goes to the bill. Um, equipment and lighting and heating and all that kind of stuff. Um, and our weed, our mill in weed is a veneer mill, so we take logs and turn it into veneer. Whoops. And we turn that into veneer. So, veneer is what's used to make plywood. If you look at a piece of plywood sideways, you've got four, five, six layers. Um, each uh, layer in that piece of plywood is a sheet of veneer like this. So, the remaining electricity goes right out to the grid um, and is shipped wherever Pacific Power wants to take it. Um, generating electricity with biomass provides environmental benefits that make it preferable, a preferred alternative to fossil fuels. Uh, burning fossil fuels such as coal and petroleum adds carbon to the atmosphere that would otherwise remain trapped underground for perpetuity, um, absent you know, geologic events, rifts breaking open, uh, volcanoes, erupt volcanoes erupting and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so basically with, with wood biomass, um, Next slide, but I've got a slide that kind of shows the, the carbon cycle. And so you've got, uh, um, oh, I can't remember the exact term right now, but uh, you, you've basically got um, carbon that's locked under the surface of the earth. And for all intents and purposes, it's there until humans go and do something with that. We can mine it as coal, oil, natural gas. Um, but that's where most of our, our carbon emissions come from in terms of greenhouse gas. With biomass from wood, or um, it, it can be algae. There's lots of um, different biomass um, sources other than just wood. Um, but generally speaking, what, what these sources do is they capture carbon that's already in the atmosphere, turn it into wood, and then whether it's being decayed.
decayed through rot in the forest, burned up in wildfires, or used in a, a cogen plant, it's just kind of part of the existing cycle. So um, there's some criticisms of biomass electricity, but overall it really doesn't increase the amount of, of carbon in the atmosphere because that carbon's already there, it's already above the surface and, and those sort of things. So I can get more into that later if you want, but generally speaking, that's that's one of the benefits of, of uh, biomass is that it's, it's not greatly increasing the, the atmospheric carbon over what's already there. So after leaving the turbine, there's still a lot of energy in that steam that we made at the boiler. Um, so there's, there's other things we use that steam for. These are our vats and um, before we can put a log into the mill to spin it into the veneer, um, we have to condition it. So 30% of the leftover steam gets sent into the vats. And these are our vats, and, and you can see eight foot blocks of wood in here, um, getting ready to load this one. Uh, we got 12 vats in total. We give these steam baths, it softens the wood, it heats it up. Um, you can imagine in weed in the wintertime, if it's 12 degrees, your wood with all that water in it naturally is gonna be a block of ice. So we gotta thaw that out, we use the steam for that. Um, so depending on the, the condition of the wood, when it goes into the vats, um, the size of the wood, it's going to stay in there from 8 to 24 hours. Um, I mentioned that. Um, so then the other process is after the veneer sheets are made, um, we have to dry that veneer. So we use the steam to heat the dryers um, to dry the veneer. So the remaining 70% of the 100% that came out of the turbine goes to our dryers. Um, on the left, on the left there, that, that is one dryer. Um, it's about 200 feet long, um, about eight or ten feet, where is my cursor? Uh, eight or ten feet tall from, from this level down to the floor, and it's nothing but rollers inside. Um, it's just a continual roll of sheets of veneer going through that. Um, and you can see the temperature there and, and the, key, the difference between the dryers and the vats is the vats actually have the steam itself going in so the wood gets wet and here we just run the steam through pipes and so that heat bleeds off and it's actually very dry heat in those dryers in fact dryer fires are one of the main problems we have if you get a plug up um, the, the sheets of veneer will plug, plug up and if it gets too hot it'll catch on fire so there's no moisture inside there other than the moisture that's being driven out of the wood. So that's, that's the other main use of the, the energy we get from the biomass. Um, here's the infeed of a dryer, just put sheets in. After that, it's all automatic. It takes between five and 11 minutes for a sheet of veneer to go through the dryer. And it depends, we do different thicknesses um, and, and different species have different moisture contents. But generally speaking, um, about seven minutes on average to get through the dryers. Um, and Usually the wood is about 50% moisture when it goes in and 5% when it comes out. Um, not all biomass is a waste product. Sometimes um, we actually go out there and harvest nothing but those small diameter trees or, or the brush or something. Um, anybody know why that might be? No, uh, come on, somebody's got a forest fire. What's that? It reduces the threat of forest fire. There you go, forest health overall is the term we use. So, and actually, I um, forgot to mention at the start of this, if you got questions, you don't have to wait till the end, just raise your hand. Yeah? Then you might have to uh, thin this. Right. Not necessarily for uh, fire prevention, but so that the healthy trees aren't overcrowded. Right, uh, that's exactly right. So there's many aspects of forest health, and, and generally speaking, um, yeah, we, we, we thin to reduce the, the chance of catastrophic wildfire. Uh, we tend to improve the health of our, our dominant, co-dominant trees. Um, there's one thing that forests never stop doing, and that's growing. So, um, you know, we, we like to take a snapshot of the forest and say, well, that's how we like to keep it. Um, if you take a hands-off approach, it's going to change just because that's what nature does. It grows. And so if you want to keep it the same um, as it is this year, a couple years, you're going to have to come in and do something to it. You're going to have to remove what's, what's grown or somehow treated. Um, so, to, to kind of illustrate this a little bit, this is, these are fire return intervals from basically pre-European settlement 
to the last 100 years, um, different forest types in the Sierra Nevada. Um, so, as you can see, since, since we've gotten here with our, our um, fire exclusion and, and putting fires out, um, we went from anywhere from an eight year, and what I guess back up a little bit, fire return intervals, they determine by looking at fire scars on trees and all that kind of stuff. But um, basically, it's how often, on average, a fire would burn through that area. Um, typically, they're low intensity, so they didn't kill the big trees they scar, and that's how we know um, how often the fires were by counting tree rings. Um, but you can see in, in oak, uh, kind of savanna areas, every eight years, on average, there used to be a fire. Now we're up about every 80 years, there's a fire. So um, we've missed seven or eight or nine cycles of fire um, in that area. So you can imagine all the fuel that's building up in those areas. Um, red fir, high elevation, used to burn every 26 years on average. Now, you know, if we keep going the way we are, every 15, 1600 years there'll be a fire. And you can imagine how much different those fires will be. So that tells you a little bit about um, one of the reasons we, we want to take biomass out. The next is just a question. No, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. How, what about the last like, six, seven years, all these mega fires that we're having? You know, I mean, if you go over to Carson, that uh, waterfall fire that we had back there in like 2004, the biggest one in state history. I mean, no offense to that, but you're showing eight years as low range, but we're having mega fires like I've never seen. Right, and that's because um, in a lot of cases we've missed all these small, more frequent fires. So nothing has happened in those that last hundred years uh -huh. to treat the, the you know, for lack of a better term, the fuels that's been accumulating out there. Okay. So the, the, the fires, you know, prior to Euro Europeans arriving were frequent and low intensity. Um, they burn off the understory, they kill the small trees, they kill the grass. Well, they wouldn't kill the grass, but they'd burn the grass up, the grass would come back, the brush would come back, small trees would start growing again, another fire would come through and um, kind of clean the stand out. We've missed all that for the last hundred years, so you've got all this ingrowth that's there, and that's what these, these pictures are going to illustrate. Um, a guy named, named George Gruel went and found all kinds of old uh, photos from um, late 1800s, early 1900s. He found the exact spot that that photo was taken. Uh, went back in the, the early 90s and retook that photo to see how things have changed. So this is just, he's got a whole book full of these, but there's just three or four here I'll show you. Um, kind of things, how things have changed with fire exclusion. Um, and you can look in the background here, uh, fairly open. Um, shrubs in here, this is most likely a wet meadow where there's a pond, or kind of like a or a pond. And generally fairly open, it's a forest that's fairly open. You come over here to 1993 and uh, you know, the pond is largely gone, the, the, the willows are gone, uh, the meadows are probably drying out uh, because the trees are coming in and taking all the moisture. So you've got more trees, less moisture in the meadow. Uh, we call this conifer um, encroachment. Um, Sequoia National Park, um, 1900 on the top here. Um, where should we go? Again, wide open hillsides, no, no trees really at all, just brush because of recurrent fires they used to have. Uh, 1995, it's completely forested. So again, you can see if the fire does come through th there, it's going to be vastly different now than it was back then. Again, same kind of thing. Murphyville, 1924 in the upper right, and uh, 1994 in the lower left. You know, again, hillsides that used to be sagebrush or ironbrush, you know, open are now are now forested. Uh, Yosemite Valley, um, again, you know, think Yosemite National Park. Oh, it's 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 gorgeous, which it is, uh, but it's seen major changes in the last 100 125 years, um, not through management, but through lack of management and fire exclusion. So that illustrates how much fuel can be building up out there and you know, fuel that we would call biomass. Um, so other reasons we may do it, um, I mentioned water a little bit, uh, biodiversity. Um, this, is, this is a picture inside of a meadow or what used to be a meadow. Uh, you can see the lodge holes here, here, coming in from the outside in. Um, Basically what happens without fire is the trees 
out compete the grass. And so we're in, in Siskiyou County, Lassen, Lodoc, uh, California overall, we're actually losing our open, natural open areas, whether it be meadow, prairie, sagebrush, um, primarily due to fire exclusion um, because of counterfeit encroachments. We actually have more forest now than we did in 1900. Um, so why do we want to treat this? Um, bio, the, the fact that we have a biomass facility allows us to do something with this material somewhat economically. If we didn't have a, 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 a place to take biomass, we couldn't really do anything with this. We can go out and cut it down, uh, but there's, there'd be no market for it. With a, with a biomass market, we can come in here with a chipping crew, cut this stuff down, uh, chip it, haul it off, and, and we don't make money at this, but at least if, if it's close enough to the mill, it's a break-even proposition. Um, so, you know, while they have that, this is a meadow that we worked on um, five or six years ago. There was a whole blanket of young lodgepole coming in. We went in there with volunteers with the Elk Foundation, cleaned it out. Um, there didn't used to be two little water holes down here, but there are now. Um, and the Elk come in here you know, uh, to use that water. We rehydrated the meadow. Um, that doesn't just help the upland areas, but then that that water is not just sitting there, it's slowly moving through the soil. This feeds into Bear Creek, which feed, feeds into the plow, which feeds into the sack, which um, you know, eventually ends up in the Sacramento Valley or Los Angeles or wherever that water goes. So um, rehydrating these meadows by taking this biomass out um, it is good for a whole, whole host of reasons, including water supply. I mean, if you kind of uh, uh, um, expand on the point of this, if this photo looks a little hazy, it's because it is. This was during the Bagney fire last year. Um, so that's all smoke from the Bagney fire. Um, so why else do we uh, use biomass? Generally speaking, um, it's either required of us or it's good business to do it. Um, some places it's required by the forest practice rules when we're doing uh, timber harvest. Um, California Public Resource Code requires in some instances for fire prevention. Um, and you know, a lot of times it's just good insurance for us to get out there and treat it. It is a, it's a fuel. Do you guys know what it's like in, in August and September around here? If you've got uh, slash on the ground that you haven't treated, um, it's a tinder box and you get a lightning strike or um, a nutcase out there with a cigarette thrown it out of the window, it turned bad real quick. Um, so the other options that we do have basically are, are burning. Um, on the left there, we've got a, a control burn and a, a clear cut where we're removing the slash through a broadcast fire. On the right, we pile, again, that's a top pile um, that we build fire, again, just to get rid of it. Um, just because we you know, don't have it out there. A lot of our roads aren't accessible to chip pans, and so one way or another, we have to treat this material, and, and for us, that's really the only other option if we can't chip it and get it out of the woods. Um, so why is, is uh, biomass power generation favorable to the pictures you just saw? Um, generally speaking, it's, it's cleaner. We state-of-the-art emission controls in our boiler. This is a, a look at our control panel. Everything's monitored. Um, NOx emissions, CO emissions, temperature, smoke, particulate, um, you name it, we're monitoring it. Um, we can control the emissions through physical, chemical, and, and process controls. Um, Process control is just that's simply mixed how the fuel and the air get mixed. So the biomass and the air, just like opening the damper on your wood stove, we can control how it burns based on that. Um, chemical controls, we use urea injection in the, the emission stack um, to reduce, um, um, I can't remember exactly what that helps. My, is that reduced NOx? Thank you. My uh, Robin Stiers was supposed to be here. He's my he's going to be my technical advisor. He actually runs the power plant for Forest over there. We he actually got called down to Sacramento for a smoke management or emissions management class, so he had to one able to make it this afternoon. And then physical controls would be an electrostatic precipitator. Um, that's on the stack. It's I believe 40,000 watts. Um, gets the particulate out, and then we actually harvest that particulate it gets turned into a uh, organic soil amendment that, that we sell to farmers, so kind of a fertilizer. So there's a whole stream from ground to tree to processing to, to utilizing to back into the ground here. Um, 
this is the, kind of the carbon cycle I mentioned earlier in terms of the atmospheric and, and uh, biomass carbon versus the, the fossil fuels um, and, and how that uh, carbon dioxide difference uh, is created. Um, so why, again, why is it favorable to produce steam over uh, open air burning? Um, it's cheaper. Um, having a fire crew out there is, is a lot of time, a lot of expense, and it's risky if you get an escape. Uh, then you got cow fire out there and, and uh, you're paying the bill for, for uh, fire suppression. We don't want that. Uh, we do get paid a little bit for our electricity, although it's not very much. Um, we, the way the rules are set up, we have to compete with hydroelectric energy, which is the cheapest form of electricity out there. So even though California's got renewable mandates in their renewable portfolio, um, biomass isn't all that profitable. Um, and in fact, if, if we didn't have other operations, it's really hard to, to have a standalone uh, biomass electricity business and, and be profitable. There are some that do it. Uh, but you have to have your fuel source really close by. You've got Wheeler Raider down in Anderson that they've got, they, they use all kinds of stuff in their process, whether it be walnut hulls from the orchards and, and orchard clippings and rice straw and all that kind of stuff. So um, this is just kind of some, some summary background stuff. Um, biomass is the country's largest source of domestic renewable energy, uh, supplying five times as much energy as wind and solar combined. Um, 100 biomass plants in the country um, supply 8.5 million homes. Basically, one megawatt is equivalent to a thousand homes. Um, so, the if we're producing 12 and a half of wheat, we use three. Um, that other nine and a half will, will uh, basically light and power 9,500 9, homes for a year, as long as the, the plant's running. Um, you can see jo uh, benefits of jobs and revenue and, and uh, that's committed to remove 68.8 million tons of forest debris every year, um, and, and on and on. Lots and lots and lots of benefits. I won't bore you with this. If you're interested in it, you can get it. I suspect I'm way over my 20 minutes. Um, questions? Yes? Uh, does the EPA monitor? Uh, yes, absolutely. We're monitored by EPA and California Air Resources Board and the county. Why was there such a big stink about it for you? Um, it sounds great. It, 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 it does. Um, and it's a proven technology. Um, I'll get into my editorial mode here. The <coughs> views of mine may not represent the companies. Um, but basically, there was a vocal minority uh, who just don't like forest resources being utilized in any way. There was some fear um, along with that. Um, that it being that close to town, um, but to give you an example, Seattle has a code or a, a biomass powered power plant in downtown Seattle. It was the exact same technology as we were proposing in Weed. Um, and, and then I guess the final thing I'll say is, is anytime you have need for a CEQA, we had to go through the CEQA process. That that to back up just a little bit, that boiler has been on site for 30 years. All we really wanted to do was put a, a, a steam turbine onto that boiler. I mean, we've been running that boiler for the steam for the vats and the, and the dryers for forever. Um, but because we were putting on a, a steam powered turbine, we had to go through CEQA. And unfortunately, there's people's, people in groups that have realized that um, through CEQA, you can make a good living litigating basically any CEQA approved project. And so, um, there was probably some of that. I mean, it's become a cottage industry. Um, people sue uh, Forest Service timber sales all the time, and, and basically the government pays them to sue us or sue the government. So there was some of that. Uh, but it was a five year process. It took us five years to get that system online, um, where we could have done it in Oregon in about 18 months. So we didn't think there was any reason for people to to you know, protest it. But um, you know, the litigious society that we live in, people always find a reason. So, unfortunately. Yeah? It's kind of a technical question. I don't know if you'd be able to answer it. Probably not. <coughs> I'll try. 
I think you mentioned you're, you're making 600 pounds of steam an hour. And 30% you're using as live steam on your logs to wet them and to heat them up. I'm wondering, the makeup water for that, I know our water, it's just not far from me, it has a lot of minerals in it. Do you have to buy distilled water to make up that water if you just use spring water or whatever? No, there's, um, the, because of the pressures and the velocities of that steam, um, our water that we run through that turbine has to be incredibly pure. Um, can have almost no minerals in it whatsoever because it'll just eat that those turbine blades down to nothing in a big hurry. Um, there was there was a, a plant that went in in the Central Valley, um, and somehow or another, something from the rice straw they were burning got into their water, um, so there was silica in there, and they burned out their turbine in like six months. Um, so the, the actual water that we run through the turbine is reused and is incredibly clear, or pure. Um, it's, it's sampled almost continuously to make sure nothing is getting into that. So it's, the, the, the turbine water is actually a closed system that will kind of heat water to use. Um, so yeah, in two boilers side by side. More or less, side more side more less okay. yeah. Something to that effect. Again, I'm not, the technical aspect of that is a little above me, but it's something like that. I know the water that runs through the turbines is constantly monitored for the utmost purity. So I'm understanding that question right. There's no water, you're not pumping any water in, you're not pumping any water out. You just fill up the tank, it pumps it, heats it up, puts it through, take the heat back out of it in different areas, and you're recycling it all the way through. The water that's in the turbine, yes. Yeah, because it's it's so hard to get that water clean and keep it clean, we want to keep it in there. There's a little tiny bit that just has to escape at times, and so it's it's replenished, but it's pretty minor. Um, and the problem over here, you can tell you the exact specifics, but it, it's, we try to keep it tight a little on that as we can. Yeah, that answered my question. Okay. Anything else? No, I arrived 10 minutes late, so this may have already been addressed, but when I arrived, you're saying you're using a, a wood veneer as fuel for the plant? We use the, the, the stuff like this that, that won't make a, a sheet of plywood. So th this was peeled off the log. Um, this is veneer, but it's too small to do anything with. So this goes back through the system, goes through a chipper, and gets put into the fuel bin. So, our, I mean, our good 54-inch um, wide sheets of veneer, our 27s, um, and what we call fishtail that we can use to put into a sheet of plywood, we don't burn that. That gets shipped up to Oregon to a layout plant and gets made into plywood. But the stuff that isn't good enough for a sheet of plywood, we chip and burn. So, do you ever burn anything else besides the veneer? Yeah. Um, we burn this. This is woods chipping. Um, and it's, this, this came out of tenant this morning. Um, got dumped off in a chip truck. Um, it, it's branches, it's bark, it's the wood. It's, it's the wood that won't make a saw log and won't make a veneer log. So it's the tops, it's the branches, it's all that kind of stuff. It's chipped up. It's generally called hog fuel, but that's the other component of, of what we burn. We burn clean chips and hog fuel. Um, ideally, we wouldn't be burning any clean chips. Generally speaking, they're worth more for paper um, and, and some other wood products like uh, particle board. But right now, the paper market is, is terrible. We used to export a lot of uh, paper chips overseas. Um, and, and all we do is burn hog fuel in the boiler right now. We're burning 80% uh, mill residuals or clean chips or scrap veneer and only 20% actual woods chips. Um, we'd actually like that to be the other way around and be getting paid for the clean chips, but right now that's not working. So, so your supply of fuel is continuous, you don't have to supplement with something else? Um, we have to, right now we're supplementing 80% or 20% with, with the woods chips. So 80% of what we're burning is just waste from the mill process of making veneer. The other 20% right now we're supplementing with, with stuff we bring in from the woods. And, you, and that's the only fuel you burn? There's no like seasonal variation or other sources? Not really. I mean, it's, it, there's market variation. If all of a sudden the price of paper chips went up, we would divert the, the clean chips that's made from this. We put that um, on rail cars and ship it up to Washington to a paper mill, and we bring in more more fuel from the woods. But uh, 
we just don't have to right now because the market for paper chips is, is so low, we can't afford to get those chips anywhere, the clean chips anywhere. So it's, it's, it's market driven. It, it does fluctuate all the time. Um, that 80 20 just happens to be what we're doing today. Um, but uh, like I said, depending on market conditions, that can, can vary quite a bit. Yeah? I wonder if, uh, and I appreciate your presentation. Um, I made a comment back when the biomass plant was going through. Mm -hmm. I have one big um, concern, and that is that when will railroad ties start being burned in it like happens in Susanville, where I lived for a time? And the emissions our permit, out. our permit won't allow that. Uh -huh. um, all our permit says we can burn unadulterated wood products. That's it. So uh, we can't if, if somebody. If we made plywood here, we could not chip that and burn it because of the resins they use. So we can use pure wood. That's all we're allowed to use. That's all our permit allows. Um, and so uh, you know, we can't use pressure treated wood. Um, in, in fact, we've been approached by you know, City Weed, Dunsmuir, Mount Shasta, hey, set up a waste collection site, chip it, burn it. Um, the problem is we have to have somebody there 24 seven watching what people have done to make sure there is nothing other than um, you know, branches, bark, and that kind of stuff. We did, if, if, if you remember, when was that bad winter? Four or five years ago where we had that real low wet snow? Um, the old Roseburg facility at the south end of Mount Shasta, uh, they opened up as a waste collection area. There were people watching that. Um, and we encouraged people to bring in their, the broken trees and the branches that fell and all that kind of stuff. We were able to burn that, but it was because there was a monitor there watching exactly what was coming in. If they saw anything that wasn't supposed to be there, they got turned around. Um, but to answer your question, our permit won't allow railroad ties. It won't allow anything that, quote, unadulterated wood product. So no paint, no varnish, nothing like that. Sounds very clean and safe and beneficial. Yeah. We're lucky we're protected by that. We don't have to worry if, right. if toxic stuff is right. trying to get slipped in because we've run out of other fuels. Right. right. Yeah. The flip yeah. side is there are emission controls that we could install that would take care of a lot of that stuff. It's too expensive. We don't want to do it. Um, there, there's electrical facilities that burn tires. Um, yeah, that's their power source. So there's, there's ways to overcome all that, but we're not in the business of that. We're in the wood business, and that's all we wanted to deal with. So, yeah. How much is domestic and export? What are the numbers? Couldn't tell you. I'm a bio, I'm a nerd biologist. I, I, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Do you, if, um, do you know, if you're thinning a uh, thinning project, are there any exemptions with California um, as far as the timber harvest plant goes? There are. If it's, or, you know, if you're thinning and you're going to use it as fuel? Uh, were you going to touch on that, Larry? Okay, I'll let Larry tackle that, but there is there are exemptions for that. One is the Lamothe exemption, and, and uh, just, if Larry's going to touch on that, I'll, I'll let him do that and just stop. Uh, hey, Carrie, if you. You, I'll just keep going up here. To, if you want us to cut off and get to Larry, um, you just let me know. Otherwise, I'll just keep answering. probably do a few more okay. questions. Yeah. Okay, so you said you're a dirt biologist. Well, I work in the woods. I'm not a soil biologist. Sorry. I'm a wildlife biologist. Um, I, I, dirt was a general term. Okay, so how has this changed the ecosystem? Which part of it? Well, you're, you know, you're looking at the soil. How rich is it? How much is it depleted by not? Gain these older growth forests in? Um, all the analysis, all the, the soil studies that have been done is that um, we're not affecting it. Most of what we bring in is, is carbon. Um, and that's you know being um, captured from the atmosphere, put into the wood. Um, if you look at this box, um, you know, there are some some needles, um, but overall it's it's wood. And so Generally speaking, where your nutrients are is in the leaves and needles. Mm -hmm. Most of that is still out on the ground to decompose to go back into the soil. Okay. Um, so, I mean, we're really, um, 
in North America are only on our first and second rotation. Would, even if there was a negative impact, we wouldn't expect to see it. Um, the Black Forest in Germany, after 20 or 30 rotations, saw significant soil nutrient loss. Yeah. Um, but that's you know, much different than we have here um, in, in different systems. Um, but uh, for instance, we've tried fertilizer um, experiments on our, our forest lands in California. They don't do any good. Um, we're moisture limited, not nutrient limited. So if we, if we irrigated our forest, we could get a lot more to grow, but adding fertilizer doesn't do anything for us. Right. Yeah, I remember you mentioned that the uh, turbine for the electrical generator is a closed loop system as far as the wire is concerned, but the steam that's uh, used to keep the logs wet, like when they're first coming into the uh, system and also for drying at the end, is that water just uh, after it's been uh, used as steam, is it just released to the atmosphere? Or it, that's not no, a it, we've got a cooling tower um, that, that we use to cool all that and condense it. And we try to keep, and water's expensive, so we want to try to keep as, as much as we can. Um, the specifics of it, I don't know. Um, I, I do know that if you go out to our mill on any given day, um, there's no water running away from from the mill. I mean, unless it's a rain on snow event or something like that, we're just getting run off. But, uh, you know, we're not releasing enough steam and water that there's any sort of runoff from our facility. In fact, our, our permits won't allow it. Larry, thank you. Thank you. Who want a certain, uh, you know, they want the fur boughs 
and the fur needles, and they process those to get the juices out, which goes into some kind of ointment and oil, and send candles, and there's just a whole array of potential products out there. So the key is connecting what we have uh, out here in the woods to markets out there. Um, and what really got this whole thing started was back then, 12, 15 years ago, uh, fire safe councils developed uh, trying to make our uh, communities uh, safer from fire. That was a, that was a focus, pretty common vision. And uh, uh, back then we were treating uh, just for fire and fire safety. And some of the landscapes, uh, like earlier you saw, this fire interval thing because of our very efficient fire suppression activities over the last uh, eighty some years. Uh, there's a, a, a huge amount of accumulation of uh, woody biomass growing out there. And uh, a lot of it isn't, isn't commercial timber. Uh, it's just overgrowth, understory, ladder fuels. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of the acres we work on, sometimes you have uh, a thousand sticks per acre. It's just, just like this, you can't hardly walk through it. Uh, and it should be anywhere from 150 to 250 sticks per acre. Stand. So it's all about forest health. Uh, I'll hand out this brochure that gives a, a good history and background of the utilization group, one of the councils around, uh, and contact information. And uh, we work with the uh, we work with colleagues of SISCUs and STEP and the retraining program. Uh, so it's about economic development, uh, trying to create markets uh, for Siskiyou County, uh, worker training. Uh, training people to go into the woods and, and, and operate machinery and do different things and different applications. And so uh, that's one of the bases for it. So um, about three years ago, uh, ourselves on the California Resource Center and the Utilization Group, we embarked on kind of an experiment because, like I said, 10 to 12 years ago, when we started work, of, uh, a lot of grants were available and fire safe councils to make communities safer and doing a lot of thinning and shaded fuel breaks and stuff like that. The first thing we really realized is that uh, this kind of activity, just like any uh, forest health activity out there, uh, produces a lot of residual biomass, slash uh, three to six inch or bigger diameter trees, firewood sized trees that are left behind. And so what do you do with that? Well, traditionally we would burn, hand pile and burn cut, hand pile, and burn, that was it. Uh, not very cost effective, uh, not very efficient, uh, not very good for air quality, um, and it was a long process, uh, and so that was pretty much the beginnings. And this will work. Not the right arrows. Okay. Uh, so this photo, just like we said, it's really about, the core of this is really about economic development trying to keep this guy working or train somebody that can go out and can still have a job. And uh, ancestrally and families uh, can come here and, and the, the ideal world is trying to create an atmosphere where they have a choice, they can stay here and live here rather than grow up here and move away to the city where they can get a job. Uh, hopefully they can at least have a choice to be able to have a chance to stay here uh, in, in the community. Um, so in, in the beginnings and in, in utilizing this stuff, uh, you know, you've heard of guerrilla marketing and this type of thing. Uh, we kind of joked with it. We, we decided, okay, we weren't going to burn the stuff out there. We're going to haul it in. Okay, well, how do we do that? Well, in the very beginnings, um, we have a, a, you know, a pickup truck and a small trailer and uh, four or five guys, and they would hand load the trailer at the end of the day after cutting all day. And uh, they'd hand load the trailer, and they came back in and they drop them off on our winter. And then uh, in the winter or off days or when we weren't doing something, then that same crew would work at processing, uh, processing wood. Uh, so uh, in, in terms of economics, that, that just wasn't uh, getting it done. Uh, because in terms of, of taking biomass uh, into value-added products that you can resell, um, it, it's, it's quite a process. And so the slash and really the wood out there on the wood laying on the ground has very little value. Uh, it's not something, you know, you have to go pick it up, not something somebody's going to pie to come do it. Uh, it's, 
not very cost effective to move and transport. But if you take that wood and you turn it into, say, cords of wood, well, now you have, you know, two or three hundred dollar unit that's it's got a value. So now you can afford maybe to process and move that X amount of miles. Uh, you take that same cord of wood and you turn it into wood bundles. You can get 168 some of these size bundles out of one quarter wood, and if you sell these at six dollars a unit, well now you've got a product that has a value of you know 900 to 1200 dollars per cord, and so now that 200 dollar cord is turned into say 900 dollars worth. So now you're getting some value that you can almost afford to truck and ship and connect with market. So that's kind of where we're going with this thing. Uh, but we found out, of course, it wasn't very efficient to uh, hand load trucks and do all that sort of thing. It was uh, you know, hard on the people and it just wasn't, wasn't very effective. But fortunately, most of our kids, they loved it, but it was you know, some, some uh, So then we decided, okay, what can we do in terms of getting more efficient? And so uh, here's a FECOM grinder that we have that treats all the slash that isn't firewood size. Now some of the applications that are around the country and the world and stuff like that, uh, if we could ever connect with the markets, they, they are products that would utilize the slash that you can pile and burn or grind. Uh, but we just haven't connected with that. So, so now our process is uh, the crew goes out and thins and cuts, limbs and tops, and uh, our pecan grinder goes in and grinds the slash and leaves the firewood size wood there that we now haul into uh, our sorting yard, our wood yard. Uh, we burn very little, uh, number one, because it's not very safe, it's not very cost effective, and air pollution things, and burning windows are shrinking and shrinking for, because of weather and air pollution quality control and those type of things. Uh, to give you an example of production, uh, when we first got our first machine, <coughs> we had an area that was had like, uh, I don't know, 150 hand miles. And uh, a crew of four to go in and burn that would take, effectively would take about two weeks of a crew of four. Uh, brought in a machine, in a day and a half we were done. And so it's very, very cost effective. And it leaves a great product, leaves some mulch behind, uh, you know, residue um, on the forest floor. Uh, so, and we kind of caught it to small scale logging, but it's not commercial. Uh, kind of speaking to a Utah, you asked the question before, uh, was about exemptions. So all this work that we're doing, all the fuels reduction, uh, all the fuels reduction, and all the forest health activities that we're doing, uh, have, we, we don't get timber harvest plant because we don't extract commercial wood to sawmill. Uh, and there are exemptions you get through uh, CAL FIRE and, and the California Forestry Rules. They have exemptions for doing fuels reduction work and forest health activity. Uh, but you get an exemption and you can, if you're a licensed timber operator or have a forester involved, you can remove uh, the small diameter wood to resell. You're not doing this commercial timber operation, but you're doing it to value added products. And so this is a very small limber. Uh, so where we can, the crews go through and makes it more, much more efficient. Uh, they'll go through and they'll cut the tree, leave it the whole length, and, and move on. This little machine comes in, picks it up, limbs it, tops it, puts it in the pile, and we haul that into the, into the sort of uh, uh, Sometimes we can't do that uh, because of, of slope and stuff like that. Uh, steep, especially on the west side. I have a question. Yes. And then you take that and make it entirely Yes. Yeah, we've, uh, we've established over in Scott Valley, a lot, a lot of the projects that we got through the Fire Safe Council and through Forestry, Equip, through NRCS, <coughs> and an array of projects, uh, a lot of it over in Scott Valley. And so we established a wood sorting yard uh, there, and it's within probably a maximum of 15 to 20 miles of any of the projects that are going at any given time, or anything, any future projects. So the haul cost, which is one of the biggest costs, is short. Uh, so we came up with this small trailer because another problem we have on the west side, there's a lot of road systems, a lot of access. But they're very small, that you can't get a large truck, you can't get a large truck, a logging truck, you can't get chip vans in there, 
they're not accessible. Most of the west side forests on private and public lands, uh, we did a study with the Forest Service here a few years ago, um, 95 of the roads, 95% of the road systems are not accessible to chip dams. So that takes one potential out of the equation. Uh, so again, we had to get something that was, that was economically feasible, and so we designed and built this trailer that can be handled by a one-ton truck minimum. And the payload uh, loaded uh, to maximum uh, is about a smidgen over what would be equivalent to uh, four and a half quarters of wood. But we can get just about anywhere and turn around and it can be very efficient. And this is what it looks like loaded. You can see very small, uh, real tight turning radius. Uh, and, and so it, it makes a bit of payload is good. The, the cost of fuel and all that for operating that truck it is much less than a logging truck. And so in, in the balance, in the scale, it's, it's just a, it's a scale. It's a down, so it, it's, it's doable. Uh, here, here's what we, uh, another view of it. Uh, back here, you can see these bumps that drop down. And uh, we usually have where we unload it. We have a, a slanted place we drive in, drop the bunks, the wood rolls off. And of course, nothing works perfectly. Something always hangs up. So we have a small little machine that we uh, throw a cable around and just pull the rest of it off. And so our, our sort yard uh, there in the valley is, uh, this isn't a Jurassic Park fence that we're trying to put, but it looks like it. But these are our uh, logs that we've uh, buried in the ground uh, for bunks, what we call bunks. And so when we bring in the wood, we stack these against these, uh, sorted by species uh, for further processing. And there's uh, one picture of uh, our sort yard uh, loaded with the, the small diameter firewood size material that comes off the project. Now sometimes uh, a landowner, a lot of the projects for the early days, they say, well, we want, we want the firewood. And say, okay, that's great. You know, we do the job. And then uh, they'd always call us back because uh, after they realized how much firewood there was, I mean, they had two lifetimes of firewood. They said, we don't want to come get it, you know, or something. So we work with the landowners. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, sometimes we, we do an economic arrangement with the landowner. Sometimes they just donate it. Uh, we process the wood. Uh, right now, our best, really our best value commodity is this little guy here, wood bundles and firewood uh, in terms of the price point. And we also utilize it locally. We donate a lot of it to uh, uh, disabled and elderly folks work with rotary clubs and like that for distribution. Uh, so anyway, we bring it into our sorting yard and then we sort it by species. We've gotten a lot more efficient because now when we haul it in, we haul it in uh, by species. So we don't have to dump it and then resort it. Uh, we save a step because every time you move it, it costs money. Mm -hmm. And it just erodes a lot of money. But here we have small equipment. You notice all this equipment is really small. You know, we call it miniature logging. So this is placing the wood by species in these bunks for storage. And this gives you a range of, there's some material out there that uh, is large size, it's uh, uh, commercial size trees, but we bring it out because it's either dead and dying or disease or something like that. Yeah. Is that your equipment up there off of Everett Memorial? Uh, no. Okay, just wondering, it's been seen there forever. Yeah. Uh, no, it's probably another option. Most of the stuff we're doing right now is on the west side. Okay. Is your operation, uh, is it self-sufficient or do you, is it rely on, on grants from the Forestry Service and that sort of thing? In the beginning, it relied a lot on grants and, and uh, what we've uh, been able to show ourselves is, is that this operation will pay for uh, removing the wood from the woods to the sort yard and processing it into the product but it doesn't bring in enough yet to pay for doing the thinning part. Uh, our ideal world, and I don't know if we'll ever get there, is to be able to go to a, a landowner and say, look, you know, we'll treat your plantation or we'll treat your acreage, you just give us the wood. And, and uh, uh, we're a long ways from that. Uh, so where the subsidy part really comes in now are grants uh, or program, programmatic, like they're NRCS for force or equipment and stuff like that funding opportunities to pay for the work in the woods, the thinning and the linning and the hopping and stuff like that. And uh, so that's what we're trying to, to work for. 
But this is an example of sometimes we do remove larger stuff. Uh, this is a wood processing machine, and in the early days we had the little, you know, we had everything from the guy with the ball splitting wood uh, to then the little bigger splitter. That, you know, it just doesn't, uh, doesn't practical. Uh, so this is a, uh, an automatic wood processor, and uh, we load the, the logs in that bunk, rolls into the conveyor, uh, moves forward, uh, the saw automatically cuts it to whatever length you want, and then it pushes out the back where the splitter is and splits it. And this little machine will uh, produce about two cords an hour, uh, depending on the efficiency of the operator. So it's a lot more efficient. And it also has a conveyor belt attachment that you don't see here, so you can also pull a truck or a vehicle or boxes or anything underneath that, and it just conveyor belt it out into the, uh, into the uh, collection. Uh, this is the result, you know, good old, uh, good old firewood, uh, and we, we do it all by species. Primarily, it's, it's dug fir, uh, ponderosa pine, cedar, and oak, which are four main species that we have the most of. Uh, there's some oak that we uh, sell commercially locally. We put it into uh, cord units, four by four by eight. Uh, so people who come to buy it and they can come, we, we deliver for a fee, but it's like you pick up type of yard, you can come in and pick it up and they can get a little cheaper. Uh, but we have it laid out this way because people can see what they're getting for a cord. Uh, and, and a lot of people are surprised how much a cord is. A lot of times, uh, you know, people are used to buying somebody's truckload, you know, and stuff like that, and it's maybe a half a cord and they're selling for a cord or not. Uh, but the, it's just part of marketing, they see exactly what they get. And uh, we have a lot of customers that come in to get it, and uh, they have a small truck, and they can't get it all at once, or they don't have enough storage at their home. And so uh, they can come and pick it up, and we'll tag, and that's their cord of wood. So maybe they'll come in, and they'll get half of it, and they'll come back another day and get the other half. And uh, so we tag it, and it's their cord, and, and it's there, so we kind of store it. Uh, then we take that split firewood, you see, and that machine, that wood processor, it has a, we can get the six different sizes of, of uh, wood split. And so we can set it at the small setting, and it'll uh, end up with this size, as you can see here. Uh, and this is a, this particular brand is called a Twister. And you bundle these woods, you put it in that metal container, set it in the rack, and twist it around with a plastic wrap, and you have this wood bundle. And part of that, I'll have you pass these around, uh, goes inside each bundle is one of these uh, signs that uh, tries to tell people the benefit of they're spending their money on this bottle of the benefit for it. Creates jobs, utilizes the biomass, uh, helps fire safety, and that sort of thing. Uh, so there's one of the end products. Um, where uh, We sell these uh, wholesale uh, at about the market price right now is we can get about three bucks a bundle. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it's a small profit margin on that. If we sell it ourselves retail, we can get anywhere from six to eight dollars a month. Uh, but the key is connecting with markets, and that's what we're dealing with now. That's, uh, we, we know now what we can do, and what we can produce, and how much it costs to do it. Now our next big challenge is getting connected with the markets. Uh, for some of the large hole wood you saw in some of the previous pictures, uh, sometimes we, we've experimented with somebody will come into the log truck and just take the whole log and go. Uh, we're getting a lot of calls from, from Climate Falls, Grants Pass, uh, Medford, people needing wood, either for firewood or whatever, you know, small mills. Uh, but they can only afford to pay about $700 to $800 a logging truck load. And quite frankly, that, that, that really doesn't, it, it's not enough money uh, for us to sell it at that rate. And we're better off making it in the firewood because the price point is better. And we're trying to connect with uh, wood wholesalers up and down the I-5 corridor uh, uh, because, because of the I-5 corridor and coordinate with companies like Stidham and stuff like that because a lot of times they'll go one way empty and they're looking for a load or something like that. So some wholesaler, they can take a, a total uh, a, a load of, of pallets of these wood bundles or pallets of processed firewood down south where they can get four or $500. Uh, we ran into a market 
haven't fully been able to uh, get enough production for them and the right kind of wood. Uh, but you know, they don't have many cold winters down there, but there's this niche market for people with their big homes and big fireplaces and for parties and gathering. They like natural wood fires in those fireplaces. And so uh, this guy was, was uh, uh, buying uh, nice oak and the drone and the nice decorative pieces that burn, and they were paying like $1,200 a core. So now you're getting to a price point that's almost, uh, almost worthwhile to transport. You know? So uh, it's taken a lot of work and, and still in transition. At least our first phase of the experiment, we know what it takes. And uh, the hope is eventually uh, we, can, we can connect with enough markets and individual landowners or anybody can, can clean up their land, make it more fire safe, and do uh, forest health activities and get a benefit to provide jobs and work and, and, and buy products. And uh, so here's our uh, wood bundles uh, on a pallet and uh, here's our contact information. Uh, feel free to call any time. Um, and, and one thing that, that I really want to make a point of is you hear a lot about forest health activities. Like I said in the beginning, in the early days, it was really focused on, on uh, fuels reduction in fire, 15 to 20 foot space in this type of thing. Now it's really growing and, and getting a, little, a lot more ecological. Uh, now we're doing part of the prescription is for, uh, is for forest health thinning. So the left trees will release and grow better, just like thinning the garden. Uh, opening up canopies, um, wildlife enhancement, wildlife development, uh, working with the Audubon societies, Rocky Mountain Health, uh, and different things. So uh, now a prescription is really a little more holistic. Uh, uh, working on a project involved with NRCS and the Oak, Oak Woodland Restoration. And we have a lot of Oak Woodlands are getting approached by juniper or conifer forest. So going in and removing the conifer element, uh, which also removes the, the fuels and fire hazard, but leaving the complexity of uh, the old oaks, so then releasing those so now they can come back. Getting the conifer canopy out of the way so uh, they're not being shaded out and that type of thing. And over, over in, the, just like you see up here in Shasta Valley and over in Scott Valley, we're really getting un inundated with juniper. And, and I, I consider juniper a weed. <laughs> it's, it's, it doesn't have much of a product in terms of uh, harvesting to a product. There's not much call for it. There was a mill for several years up in Town Falls that were making you know, juniper posts and, and different things like that, and it just didn't work out economically. Um, but some of the studies have shown that a, uh, what they call a mature a juniper tree, which they call 12 to 14 inch diameter, if the water's available, can suck up to 200 gallons a day, uh, supposedly, some of the studies have shown. And uh, there's been some places over on the east side of Scott Valley where um, there's been nothing done in terms of an official study yet, uh, but in the old days, old folks say, well, here in this gulch, we had this spring and flow, and, and, and there wasn't a lot of vegetation around and over the years uh, juniper has come in and some of the springs have dried up. Of course we've also gone into a drier cycle. But a couple of the ranchers and stuff had just an experiment. They went and eliminated, cut all the juniper around the area of that, you know, several acres around that spring and the springs started flowing. And so there's something to that. It's another, another project. Another thing. But we're really moving towards more ecological treatments expanding for wildlife and, and those type of things. And uh, uh, one of the things that we're looking at uh, as a group is we're doing a feasibility study now for the potential of a pellet mill uh, somewhere in Siskiyou County, you know, wherever it might make sense. So there's things coming in the future. There's projects. There's some large uh, projects coming in on, on public lands west of uh, Wairika uh, that's starting in maybe Oh, year 16, 15 or 16 is going to produce a lot of biomass by design of the prescription. And so if there's a window of opportunity we might be able to develop something. Uh, uh, you'll see a lot, of, a lot of power generation biomass uh, facilities that like Roseburg and, and throughout the state of California. I mean, they're a huge investment. I mean, up to, up to 
$60 million for an investment. And that's pretty hard to do. And fortunately, in Siskiyou County, we have one. And so why build it now? Let's use it. You know? So that's one good anger point we have. And so we're looking at things, and in the recent research we've done, it is pellet mills seem to be maybe a viable thing because uh, for about two to five million dollars, you can uh, you can install and build a small level uh, pellet mill that will also produce wood uh, pucks and bricks. And the the pellet mill, the, the chips and stuff that go into the pellet mill produce the pellet have to be they have to be dried and have to be clean, uh, it's not to produce a quality pellet, so that takes a process. But the, the pucks and the bricks can use pretty much the dirty wood. They can use the slash because it's a compression. And it is basically uh, firewood with BTUs out of these compressed uh, pucks and, and bricks. Uh, more BTUs than a chunk of firewood. Easier to handle, more compact, and, and easier for folks to handle their wood stove especially the elderly and stuff. And, and in terms of a market, if you had a pellet mill, the first thing you say, well, you know, we're gonna have to convert everybody to pellet stoves. Well, this way, and in the ideal world, once we prove it out one way or the other, is you have a pellet, producing pellets, you're producing the pucks and the bricks, so people who have wood stoves purchase that. People who want pellet mills, or pellets, can use the pellets, and you can provide pellet stoves and that type of thing. And right now, there is, there is quite a huge export business uh, going to Europe and Pacific Rim countries uh, on pellet. And uh, uh, so there's an opportunity for export and market. And, and probably the best way to go is not try to create your own brand or anything, just produce the product. You find out who's doing the distribution. As you see in the stores now here in Oregon, uh, in Wairiki, you can buy bags of pellets. So you find out who that distributor is and say, well, well, you give us your bags and we'll give you the pot. Or why reinvent the wheel? So those are the kind of things that, that, that we're looking at. Uh, and, and one of the folks, like you said, we never really focus on it, is this closed loop back to creating jobs. And uh, in economics right now, a lot of the economics around our wood products in Siskiyou County are leaving the county. The money doesn't stay here. Uh, you'll see a, other than timber products and, and Roseburg, uh, a lot of the log loads are going out of the county. And we need to close that, but we need that money to stay here. So that's what we're looking at. We're, you know, we're far from where we want to be. Uh, we've proven some things. we found some things that don't work. But uh, trying to create this niche market. And it just takes persistence and sticking to it and, uh, and uh, trying, trying to figure it out. And, and What's encouraging, it's, it's, it's a long process and probably going to be a longer process, but what's encouraging, it's nothing new. It's being done in other parts of the country, in other countries, and right next door in Oregon and Washington. So why can't we do it in Siskiyou County? So it's just making those steps. And it's going to take some sedation in the beginning. But ideally, um, you know, the grants and everything are wonderful. It keeps people working. We get a lot done on the ground. But... Uh, someday in this county and as a country, uh, we have to produce something that, that has its own value. And we can't, we, we've got to get off the subsidies. So everything we do, we've got to get to where it's self-sustainable, pays for itself. And uh, so that's, that's one of our goals. It's a lot to get into one thing, but it's, it's a pretty big picture. Larry, is, so is it cost prohibitive then for a Landowner to consider, for example, um, um, getting bid like on um, a resource center to come in and, and do a, a thinning project? Yeah, right at this point, uh, uh, right now, the, the best we can do, it, it costs about uh, to do the cutting and the thinning and the processing and stuff like that, getting to the point where we can haul something offline is anywhere from $800 to $1,400 an acre. Uh, what was it per? $800 to $1,400 per acre. Per acre. To do that work. And uh, fortunately, in the last years, uh, with different grants and NRCS's equip program and stuff like that, <coughs> it, that pretty much pays for that cost. Uh, 
that someday we've got through pellet mills and there's probably no one silver bullet, it's going to take an array, firewood, bundles, pots, pellets, whatever, uh, to, like we say, ideally to hopefully someday that a, uh, a landowner, big, small, or whatever, is going to say, well, hey, you know, I want you to come in and thin this material and, and it doesn't cost him anything. Maybe someday they can even get a little money back. Uh, and that comes with exploring some of these other potential avenues over time of, uh, you know, companies that, uh, you know, in the fall they want, they want fur boughs for reese, you know, reese companies. You, you cut them and ship them back east. Or, uh, you know, there's ointments and, like I said, scented candles. I mean, there's a whole array of stuff, you know. Uh, anytime when you're down in San Francisco or down in LA, the bigger metropolitan areas, go into the knick-knack shops and you start looking at and you'll be amazed at the number of products sitting on the shelves. You know, perfumes, and it's all wood-based. Either either wood or scented, or the oils extracted from the wood, stuff like that. Jim? Um, I, I'm familiar with the term of sustainable extraction for you know, multiple things out of the floor. So, you bring, so if you went in and cut boughs for whatever reason and shipped them out on a commercial basis, is that still going to be covered by the forest rules? I mean, are you, you suddenly, I don't need a permit or regulation to walk out the door. You know. Right, so so far it would fit within the exemption because it's it's a value added project and it's not, it's not a, it's not going to timber. It's not timber harvest. It's utilizing the, uh, so you can, uh, you can get that under the exemption as long as you're reducing fuels and that kind of thing. And we, we've done an experiment and, and using the best process you doing the boughs as an example, is we go in and treat acres and thin it and stuff like that, but the fir trees we wouldn't, uh, because part of the treatment is limiting the trees up that are the, the leaf trees, so you don't get the ladder peel. Well, the fir trees we wouldn't limb up. We'd go back in the fall and, and limb them and, and capture them and bag them and ship them off to somebody that was using them for boughs. So there's all these different opportunities over time that, 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 that are niche things, and it's all timing. So those are all the things that need to be worked out, but uh, uh, you know, we're, we see it happening in other parts of the country. Uh, the, the biggest problem we have, like we said, is access, especially on the west side, steep slopes, small, narrow roads. Um, uh, so chip vans and stuff aren't, aren't applicable, so we've got to look at other opportunities. And then connecting with the markets here, and how do we get it now from, say, our sorting yard, where now we have a value product that we can at least move to I-5 and connect that with something. Uh, and so that's, that's the big component that, that still has to be worked out. But proving that we can, one thing we know, uh, there's no lack of product out there when it grows every day. And uh, there's always a need, so that's not an issue anymore. It's now connecting economically with the markets. So that's a challenge, yeah. I always keep my eye out for firewood when I'm out in the forest. And sometimes out in the forest. And you probably consider this, maybe a party work towards this. Um, I still come across um, projects, sitting projects, small diameter, where um, the Forest Service is. Uh, has Camp piles and they burn it. Um, and um, is it conceivable that uh, 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 agency and outfit like yours could work with the Forest Service and they get people out there already dropping it, you know, cutting it, living it yeah. instead of putting it in a pile, put it around the trailer. Yeah. We'll take care of the rest, and they don't have to. They're done. Yeah. They didn't have slash piles, but it's going to reduce the time that they would have to otherwise spend managing the burn piles. Yeah. And there's, there's, there's product right there. Well, it, it, what you say is, is a very practical based observation. And now it's going to get on my soapbox, and, and it, it's, it's practical. And uh, we're working on those things. You know, we have participating agreements with the Forest Service, and there's stewardship things. And, but you get in that, the, the rules and the regulations and the bureaucracy yeah. and the paperwork, all of a sudden, it's not practical anymore. 
and it's not cost effective anymore. A lot just from just from the office side, just from the paperwork side. You know, uh, and, and sometimes it's the hall cost. Uh, we uh, and sometimes you you know you can buy those top piles for next to nothing from the floor store, but they're way out there, and uh, you to haul them because you still have to load them and haul them or you work it out even so it, it's it's tough. And where do you take them to? You know, well, we take them to a sorting yard, maybe like we have. Then what do you do with them? Tops are kind of hard to deal with because they're kind of gnarly and nasty, and you know, they kind of stick together. Uh, uh, but but it, your observation is absolutely right. And if we can if we can get the regulatory standards right, and make things a little simpler. And, and we're not saying going and butcher the forest. We're doing a good balanced approach. Those kind of operations make it very practical place things will and can work. And so not only are we finding the cost of doing things and trying to find efficiencies with markets, we're also uh, trying to change legislation and rules to make certain activities uh, a little more practical based. Just like in public lands, you know, you, you'll have uh, public lands and private land next door, you'll have a catastrophic wildfire go through. Private timber company could be there in two weeks harvesting, and the Forest Service never gets there because of the rules and regulations, and uh, it's just not practical. Yes. No. Yeah. Scratchy. Do you have a dedicated uh, RTF to sign off on those exemptions, or is that something that? You uh, so who we have to sign off on is, is council. Council. Department of Forestry. It's a form that you fill out and the activity and maps and all that. And they sign off on it, and they come inspect once in a while, make sure you're not really doing a real timber sale. Uh, but you, but it is it is required to have a forester or a, a licensed timber operator uh, to be the oversight of the project. Does that add a significant cost to your? Uh, a little bit. Uh, uh, it makes it a little easier for our endeavors. I'm a licensed timber operator, and we do a lot of work on uh, on fruit grower supply and timber vest, and they have. They have their foresters, and so there's been, a, as part of this thing, there's been a lot of donated time, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, but the real costs come in if you're going to do a, a bona fide timber sale. But so far, the, the regulatory issues and the bureaucracy of doing these exemptions are pretty minuscule, fortunately. Any other questions? Yes, I had a question you mentioned maybe you get $1,200 a quarter out of the city, but most major cities have air pollution quality. Exactly. And you can't even burn wood. That's right. Well, I mean, Medford's a good example. You know, yeah. The basement up there, I mean, wood stoves are you know, getting questionable because of the air quality standards and stuff like that. And so there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of things out there that, that, uh, that make things uh, not very practical. Uh, and so it's weaving through all those things. Uh, whereas it's something, uh, hopefully in the future, the products like the uh, the bricks, pucks, or the pellets are much more uh, clean burn and, and are acceptable. And so that's where we're going to have to go to. Yeah. You know, just the old days of throwing wood in the stove were probably going to be limited. Is the only thing that, so you said that uh, juniper is that weed, you know, uh, is the only thing possible to do with juniper now is pull it out of the ground and make a pile inside bark? That's what a lot of people are doing. You know, you know, the, the, our bog was plant loves it. Yeah. Sir? For fuel, uh, Roseburg. It's great for fuel for the, the goat in there. So people can pull trees on the ground and bring it into you and not long? No, I mean, <laughs> because of the issue with, I mean, we have contractors, uh, CLT, Tristan Allen is out there chipping, you know, a thousand acres of juniper a day, uh, for exaggeration, but he's hammering the juniper, we're buying chips from him. Um, generally speaking, because of the way our log yard works, um, we don't accept stuff from the public. It would have to be through an LTO, that's the timber operator. Um, you could just rip it out of the ground because we don't want all the dirt and all that kind of stuff associated with the root lots. But um, if you could find a contractor that had the equipment to get something um, in a chip band, you know, then it would be something that. But from what I heard earlier, it costs, what did you say, $800 to $1,000 an acre to, to, for a landlord to have somebody like you do that? Yeah, 800 to Eight hundred to fourteen hundred dollars an acre, depending on how thick it is. And so that makes it pretty cost effective. If you got thirty acres, you know, you pay that, you know, thirty thousand, forty thousand. Well, and what we run into in the juniper, we, we do a lot of. There's a juniper flat fire.
Fire City Council and the community out there, and we work with the Alamo Enforcers uh, collaboratively doing fuels reduction out there. And uh, the problem we're finding out there just mechanically is you have the junipers, and they're, they're pretty tough for a faller to get up to them, you know, just because of the way the limbs are and they're really stout. No, they're always in lab or rock. Yeah, and they're in lab or rock, and, you know, pretty. It's a pain. It's, it's a pain, pain. yeah. And, uh, uh, but also, because of the sand, the, the bark is inundated with sand, so it's, it, it's, it's hell on a chain. Or if you have a chip grinder or a chipper, man, it just eats those teeth, and so uh, even the teeth on our Fecon grinder, it's incredible how much, we're, we're just dealing with the slash, it's incredible, uh, you know, the wear and tear, just that sand, you wouldn't think of that there, but, but it's all in the bark and everything. So it sounds to me like, my original question, the only thing to do is pull out the ground and set fire to it? Right now, a lot of people, a lot of people are using it for firewood, it's, it's good firewood, but in terms of, of volume, you know, uh, uh, yeah, we haven't found a good market for juniper. Yeah. Probably the best best use right now is, is the is the chips to Roseburg, but you know it has to be. <coughs> and it's got to be within a reasonable distance. Yeah. You know, but the hall is the hall is what kills us. Yeah. Um, you know, I said almost oh, six seven years ago we could afford the hall and chip band. You know, 50, 60 miles now, if it's not within 20 miles of the mill, it just doesn't pay to get there. Yeah, a few years ago, we had a, an operator in Scott Valley who was uh, hauling chips from Scott Valley to Burnham uh, to their plant. But that was the thing to remember. And it's all market driven. And that's one of the risks with doing anything with the pellet mills or anything like that is uh, unless you have a kind of a local, say, a pellet mill in Siskiyou County, and you'd have to have a pretty uh, solid local market to be your foundation uh, because the, in case the export export business you know, fluctuates up and down, you have to have a kind of solid base so you can survive. Uh, so there, there's a lot to look into, but it's uh, uh, so far so far we've seen enough to it's encouraging to continue to move forward at whatever pace we can with funding and resources, and, and hopefully. Uh, you know, we're, we're a non-profit. Uh, the thing, what we're trying to look at it is kind of be the incubator for this, uh, work out the nuts and bolts, maybe get something up and running uh, that we could do fairly <coughs> expensively because we don't have the investors that we have to answer to, and, uh, you know, and stocks and all that sort of thing. But get it going to demonstrate it and then get it to a point, uh, you know, like an incubator type thing, and then get an outside investor to come in and take it over commercially and spin it off. I've been told juniper bearers are used for making gin. They would be started still. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like I say, it's not going to be what we found. You know, we said forest health treatments are varied, uh, but they all are interconnected. Uh, and there's a lot of potential products out there that could be utilized, and it's just the work of connecting with all the different things that are, that are going on. The other missing element that, that you know, Mary or I touched on yet yeah, is. Forest treatments are incredibly expensive, but the alternative forest fire fighting is a whole order of magnitude more expensive. So in this part of the world, it's not a question of if it's going to burn. It's <coughs> um, and so, I mean, we've had fires along the adjacent to us. The Cal Fire dropped a million bucks in 24 hours, just like that fighting. You know, 700 acre fire. Um, you can thin a lot of acres for a million bucks. It come out on your head, and then when a fire does get there, um, you, know, you can do one of two things. You can let it scope around through the understory like they used to do 150 years ago, or if you want to put it out in the sensitive community, you can get it out with you know, limited resources. You don't need 10 air hangers and, and you know, 20 dozers and 30 anchors. You know, a couple of engines can get out there with a hose light and put it out. And, that, and that's true, and that's one of the things in the industry that we're fighting. Uh, the cost of suppression is so much, and, and heck, give us a third of that, and we can get a lot of forest health activities all kind of done, and it would be beneficial. But uh, uh, fire suppression, firefighting has become a business in the private sector. When you think of the airplanes and, and, and manufacturing the engines and the trucks and the, 
the gear and the tools, and there's big time lobbyists uh, every day in Washington, D.C. trying to maintain it. And we're not necessarily saying get rid of that. We're saying dedicate some money somewhere, uh, because, because that's the trouble. Everybody is, every year, we see all these catastrophic wildfires and homes burning up, and then all of a sudden everybody gets excited. But believe it or not, the money allocated for doing fuels treatment, just fuels treatment, is defined. Almost nothing. And uh, an earlier question in, in the, uh, his presentation, somebody asked about soil. Well, if you take uh, the more regular fire interval than the force that we used to, like we've talked about, low intensity, creeps around, does some good. It's, it's part, fire is part of the natural process and part of the ecosystem, really. Uh, but you take that versus now our fires are catastrophic. And I mean, they're, they're, they are, uh, they're changing, their landscape changing. will probably never be what it was again. Uh, um, if it was, it's like you're looking at 1,000, 2,000 year windows. But these catastrophic wildfires, they don't just incinerate the wood. They incinerate the soil and the microbes. You know, there, there's a whole other world underneath the soil like that that we don't visually see. Well, look, air pollution may cause. Yeah, and, the, and they talk about air pollution. You look at the air pollution. You know, I, I've, I've uh, had a lot of experience with fire, wild and firefighting and, and post-fire treatment. And, uh, you know, there, there were some places uh, back in the 87 fires that were in the Salmon River that, I mean, just ripped. And, uh, there's places still over today that have uh, they have crystallized soil that burns so hot it just created that thick it's like ice sheets just laying over the thing. I mean it's incredible. And so uh, that's kind of where I get on my soapbox. I mean some people say, well, fire is natural. It is, but not in this environment that we've created today. And so uh, do we want to leave it alone and incinerate things, or do we want to? go in and do some balanced treatment that's good for everybody. And, and that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of our stance. And then once you set that clock back through treatment, then you can let the fire go a little bit again because it doesn't have the negative effects that, that we're seeing now. Yeah, every, every year, uh, and we work closely with the Forest Service. Uh, we have a, a very good uh, forward-thinking forest supervisor on the final thousand forest, and we work closely on, on these things. And every year, the national emphasis is this debate of let it burn or not. And and so then, they well, to leave it up to the regional office, leave it up to local foresters or firefighters, because it's a unique situation. And, but all it takes is for one to get away, and it's just like it, 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 it's terrible. But it, it's it, it's. Uh, it's really difficult to make that let it burn decision because uh, to let it burn, it's going to burn catastrophic. Uh, you know, back, back in the early days, I used to work with the Forest Service way back when, and we did under burns and prescribed burns. And there were areas where you can go through and, and you start at the, at the top of the hill, drip torches, and you do little 10 foot strips back and forth, low intensity burn and stuff like that. And now, a lot of times, because of of, uh, of budgets, less money. They're still trying to do prescribed burn, but a lot of times they'll put a fire line around it and they'll start it at the bottom and it'll burn. And you get a lot of incineration you know, compared to what it used to be. And so there's a lot of reasons <coughs> that lead to uh, these issues and debates over uh, you know, what's healthy and what isn't and what works and what doesn't. It's, it's very complex.
Um, but essentially, we're, we go in and we take out some of those surface fuels that otherwise would turn maybe just a meandering fire into something catastrophic. Um, and then we offer lunch too. So it's a fun thing. We had um, we did one in December. We had a really good time. So if you're free to that the 19th, then I would suggest come out. Um, give us a call and we can give you directions. Um, and the second one is our next workshop is on community forestry. And the question was brought up. Well, what about going into forest service land and taking care of it? What about having uh, you know stewardship agreements with them to take out?